This continues my fixed income subseries assigned to FRM candidates. That means I'm transitioning from chapter two to chapter three, the beginning of chapter three, where we look at realized returns on fixed income instruments, in this case, bonds, realized returns, and we have two perspectives to look at. The gross realized return and the net realized return, the net realized return explicitly counts the cost of financing or funding the purchase of the bond. That's the difference. And we want to be really mindful of the fact that these are holding period returns. They're returns over some period, could be six months, could be one year, could be two years, meaning they are not naturally annualized unless we do that. The first of Tuckman's three examples is the gross realized return over six months. And I do think it's important to recognize that this is a holding period return. So I'm just going to add that in there. HPR standing for holding period return, which means it's the return over some holding period. The period could be one month, six months. It could be two years. What that means is it's not annualized. We would have to go to the effort to annualize the return. But the holding period return is just very simple in the sense that it's a return over some period that we've selected. So it's very important to be mindful of that because comparing different holding period returns can be misleading because they probably are of different durations. So the, but the benefit of the holding period return is that it's, the formula is super simple, right? So if I just put it right here, holding period return, we can take the price that we realize or sell the instrument for, and I'm going I'm to denote that here, P sub T, the price that we sell or realize in the future at times T. And then we want to add any dividend income that we receive during the holding period. So normally I'd put a D there, except this is a bond and the analog to dividend income here is the coupon income. So I'm going to use a C but it's coupon income during the holding period. And then we would subtract the initial purchase price. And I'm going to denote that P sub zero as in we purchase today at time zero. We sell later at the future time, right? That's our capital gain, but we want to add any income in the form of coupon. So the numerator here is the dollar gain, hopefully, but maybe loss during the holding period, whatever that duration happens to be. And then we would divide by the initial purchase price to translate this into a percent or percentage, if you like. So that's the super simple formula. And then here for Tuckman's assumptions, it's a 4.5% coupon bond. As usual, coupons expressed per annum. And then, so that really doesn't tell us how often the coupons are paid. But throughout Tuckman, that's that most common uh scenario for coupons, which they pay every six months or semi-annual pay bonds. And in this case, it's the purchase price on the bond is $105.85.6. And then six months later, the owner is going to sell this bond. That's the realized part, right? Realized for sale. If we didn't sell, it'd be unrealized. And going to receive a, here one of the coupons. After all, coupon pay every six months that's half of the 4.5% times 100, or a coupon of $2.25 at the same time that they sell this bond for, you can see, a lower purchase, a lower price here of 105. Purchase at 105.85.6 cents, sell for 105. We actually are not too surprised to see this, right? If, the, if, if we have an assumption of unchanged yield, if the yield's the same, then this premium price bond would get pulled to par, right? So we would expect the price to decrease if the yield's constant. So then the gross realized return is just the holding period return, but over the six months, right? So this formula, super simple. We take the price of sale, we add that coupon, and we subtract the purchase price, and then translate it into a percentage by dividing by that price. And we get the 1.317%. 1 is the gross realized return, but it would be important to say there that that's over six months because this number is not annualized. I could annualize it. All I have to do is say one plus this number, square it and subtract one. And the annualized number is 2.65%. 
Okay, but Tuckman doesn't show that. I go to the second and the third example, second of the three examples, and now again a gross realized holding period return, but this time the holding period is one year as opposed to just six months. So what's the difference here? The difference is that we're going to get two coupons. We get one coupon halfway through this one year holding period, and then we get another coupon at the end of the holding period. And so then the holding period is the same, right? We're in the numerator, we're getting the price of the, the sell of the bond, we're, but this time we're getting a coupon one, and then we're getting coupon two, and we have the initial purchase price, and then we divide by the initial purchase price. However, this first bond here, this first, I'm sorry, this first coupon in six months, we have $2.25 of cash. And so we probably don't want to just let that cash sit there and earn zero. It gets reinvested. So Tuckman makes the point that there's a reinvestment assumption here. Oftentimes, we assume for simplicity that the coupon gets reinvested at the yield, at the bond's yield. Um, that's not the assumption here. Here, it's an explicit assumption that the coupon is reinvested at 0.6% uh, or 60 basis points, if you like. Right, so that's the key here. This this coupon here, I'll just draw a little arrow to represent that, gets reinvested at 0.6% per annum, but it's only over the six months from November 30th to May 31st of the next year when this bond is sold. So six months reinvestment on this first coupon. The second coupon here of $2.25 well, it's received just as we're selling, so it does not get the benefit of any reinvestment, right? So that, that first coupon here, that's just the one tweak we have to be aware of. Okay, so I'll implement that now, and I'm just going to re-key it in. I'm going to take that final price that we received on the bond. That's really one year after we purchased it, right? It's almost on 6-1-2011, one year after we purchase it. I'm going to add the coupon income that we received in six months at November 30th. And now I want to remember, I want to give, I want to compound that coupon value. That really brings it forward as a future value, assuming reinvestment. That's my um, 60 basis points here. So that's, that's a value in that cell. But um, it, we're using semi-annual compounding. So I divide by two. And then here, I would raise this to the power of the number of annual periods multiplied by 2. Well, the number of annual periods is 0.5. It's, we're, uh, we're reinvesting this coupon for 6 months. 0.5 times 2 is 1. So my power here is 1. So I'm just going to leave that alone. And then I get the next or next coupon. That's the coupon one year after purchase. And then I'm going to subtract my purchase price. And then I'm going to divide by my purchase price. And let's see, I don't like my value there because oh, what I did here is I meant to add my coupon. 3.449%. Okay, that matches Tuckman. That's my gross realized return over one year with this interim coupon reinvested at uh, 60 basis points. Okay, good. And then I can go to my third and final example. In this case now, we switch from gross to net realized return, right? So that's a key point here in the lesson is the net realized return. What does that mean? Well, the net realized return explicitly counts the funding cost. And this is something that we generally do when we move to beginner finance and then do then immediate and advanced in finance. It's very common to explicitly count funding funding or financing cost. I believe, um, I'm calling it funding cost, but I believe uh, Tuckman may call it financing cost. I'm using them as synonyms here. And what we mean in this case is that, as before, we purchased this bond for $105.85.6. However, notice, we borrow to make that purchase, right? That's the negative, it, the negative um, completely uh, funds the purchase price. Now, we typically do this, or we oftentimes do this, even if we aren't really borrowing. That's because if we're using our cash, 
that cash as an opportunity cost. So that's what I mean by in intermediate advanced finance, we tend to explicitly count the funding cost. And that's what the net here means. It means that it's not a free lunch to purchase this bond. So we have a borrowing here of 105 or the purchase price. And then we need an assumption for the borrowing rate. Tuckman's is 20 basis points. Again, without any specification, we want to assume per annum, although we're only in this case borrowing for six months. And then we sell the bond as before. And so the it's still a holding period return, right? And such that we're going to take the final uh, sale price of 105. We're going to add the coupon. And then we're going to subtract the initial purchase price. However, not the purchase price, right? Because we had to borrow and then we pay off the loan, right? So what we're really doing, I'm going to say... I'm going to just use P sub L to indicate that what we're subtracting is the really the carried forward purchase price under the assumption that we borrowed to do it. So you can see at 105, 85.6 cents, actually, by the time we pay the loan off, of course, that grows. So it's this amount that's used to get the net realized return in the numerator. And then we have a question about what do we use for the denominator. And it's not immediately obvious, maybe it is to you, but should we use cash? Well, what's the cash that we used here in June 1st? We borrowed the full amount. Actually, the cash is zero, but we can't divide by zero, as Tuckman points out. We can't really use initial cash. Well, realistically, might we borrow 90% and put 10% cash in, then we could use the 10% cash? We could, but that means we would get a different net realized return depending on how much leverage. If I use 10% here and if you used if I used 10% down and you used 20% borrowed 80, somebody else borrowed 70%, we would each get a different net realized return. In fact, the primary determinant of the net realized return would be how much leverage we use. So that would not be a good measure of this bond's actual return. And so what Tuckman says, and I'm just going to read it actually, is therefore, when calculating realized returns on securities, even when the securities are financed, it is conventional to divide that final value by the initial price of the security. So in order to, in order to avoid these distortions caused by different leverage that might be used, in this case, 100% leverage, meaning a zero is impossible to use, we just use the initial purchase price. Okay, so that makes this formula actually pretty simple. Going back to our holding period return, we have a price, we have coupon that we've received, and then we have the loan that we're paying off. And I need to use a plus there because that loan is, is coming in negative. I followed Tuckman's format here pretty much as, as possible. And then we would divide that by... Um, you know, uh, overcoming that philosophical dilemma, and we just go back to the purchase price. And we get a net realized return of 1.217%. Tuckman says, oh, that looks a little familiar. Well, our gross realized return, our first out of these three exercises over six months, you may recall, was 1.317. I'm not going to use the percentage points. Uh, pretty close to that. Tuckman points out, well, yeah, it's the gross realized return, minus the financing cost. And that's our borrowing rate here, 0.2, but um, we only borrowed for six months, and this is per annum, so divide by two, right? That gets our, guess our 1.217%. So we could have saved ourselves some time and just taken that 1.317% and divide by the six-month borrowing rate of uh, 10 basis points, or just subtract that 10 basis points, and we would have gotten our net realized return. But we go through this to understand what that means. So that third and final exercise here again is, is, is the net realized, the net means that we are explicitly including the borrowing or financing of this purchase, and we're paying off that loan. And so we are explicitly counting financing or funding cost in the realized return, which is still a holding period return, which happens to be six months. 
so it is not annualized. We want to understand that's very important there to say that that's over six months and is not annualized. So if that video is helpful, then you please do subscribe to the channel so you get our notifications. Thank you.